Hi everyone, welcome to the research seminar series for the School of Applied Sciences. Uh, my name is Dr Chris Watkins, Senior Lecturer in Psychology. Uh, today's uh, seminar will have a slightly different format. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A, roughly 50, 50, 30 minutes talk and then the rest of the time for Q&A. Uh, so as per usual, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the top right hand corner and we'll try and get through uh, to all of your questions. OK, so it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Nick Aldis, for our research seminar. Uh, Nick and I were in the same year at school together in Norfolk, and he certainly went on to achieve great things within a field that um, he is passionate in. Uh, he began strength and conditioning work, if you like, at the age of 13, and his wrestling career aged 17, um, eventually moving over to the US in 2008 to join uh, TNA Wrestling, uh, where he held the tag team titles twice and the heavyweight championship once. Um, and then since uh, 2017, he joined the National Wrestling Alliance, or NWA, uh, the world's longest running um, wrestling company. Uh, there he is the current world's heavyweight champion, um, a belt held by um, other great wrestlers such as Dan Seven, Harley Race and Ric Flair, um, which he has held for over um, 800 days thus far. Um, other accolades include uh, presenting World's Strongest Man in the UK, um, and his role as Oblivion on UK Gladiators. He currently resides in uh, Tennessee uh, with his wife, uh, Mickey James, herself a former uh, WWE uh, Women's Champion. Uh, so Nick's talk will be about uh, the concept of pain through growth in athletics, uh, business and psychology. Uh, so Nick, uh, welcome to Abate. It's really great to um, have you here and I'll hand over to you just now. Thank you, Chris. Um, that was a very kind introduction, and uh, so I, I appreciate not having to uh, <clears throat> give give too much of a of a background on who I am because there's no way to do it without coming off as somewhat uh, braggy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, I've I've been um, very fortunate to to have some great opportunities in my life, uh, and uh, and I when when Chris approached me today about giving this talk. Um, the, the thing that really stood out to me was the was the relationship to me between uh, physicality, for lack of a better word, and psychology, which although they may not always seem like two things that go hand in hand, certainly in my line of work, uh, they absolutely do. So I'd like to start by saying that my hope for this talk is that by the end, you may have changed the way you think about pain and even maybe developed a healthy relationship with it. Now, I want to be clear. I don't want you to think I'm some sort of masochist uh, who enjoys pain. I have, however, learned to embrace pain and discomfort, look forward to what it can lead to, and therefore change the way I anticipate the uncomfortable, because I'm of the opinion that pain and discomfort is the price of admission to the extraordinary. I'm going to describe a few examples from my own life and career that maybe will help highlight this theory and hopefully you'll see how I've come to this conclusion. <clears throat> Our inherent nature is to avoid pain and discomfort. Understanding and identifying danger is essential to survival for any species and so is the basis for learning at a fundamental level. But our ability as humans to explore things that are counterintuitive is one of the things that separates us from other species. We've developed an understanding that in order to make progress, sometimes we have to experiment. Sometimes we have to go against our instinct and often pain and discomfort is a consequence. When I look at my career choice, I would go a step further and say that pain is inevitable. And more importantly, I think somewhat of a necessity. So we'll start with the obvious. I'm a pro wrestler. Uh, now, I understand that some of you are probably not remotely interested in wrestling, and that's fine. Uh, but I'm confident that regardless of your level of interest, 
you're probably familiar with the genre and the fact that it's a billion dollar industry with fans all over the world. You're also probably aware that despite the predetermined nature of the action, which is something that we don't hide from anymore, the physical toll that it takes on our bodies is anything but fake. One of our common phrases we use when when this this subject gets brought up to us is you can't fake gravity. What you can and must do, however, to be a professional wrestler or certainly to be one for an extended period of time is learn the best technique to withstand the impact whilst minimizing the risk of injury. So simply put, we learn how to fall. That phrase, we'll learn how to fall, used to be met with hostility by previous generations of wrestlers because of the derisive way it was used by critics. So, oh, these guys, they learn how to fall. As if, it, as if we were somehow duping people by learning how to fall and you know, developing this technique. But I've never had an issue with it because they also teach you how to fall in a lot of martial arts, like judo, for example, which I did when I was a kid, for the exact same reason. It's self-preservation. You know, injury prevention is a major part of the evolution of all kinds of sporting techniques. And so in, in that respect, Pro wrestling is no exception. The difference with what we do is that we intentionally endure multiple impacts or as we call it, take bumps in order to enhance the entertainment value of what we do to our audience. So being a wrestler is sort of like being one third professional athlete, one third stuntman and one third actor. Uh, as a wrestler, Physical pain is part of the job description. You know, we fall down repeatedly on a ring surface that's made up of metal beams, plywood, a thin layer of padding and a canvas. Our objective is to make our audience so emotionally invested in the story we're telling both in the ring and prior to getting in the ring that the inevitable pain and discomfort is worth enduring for the sake of the financial return. And that may be in the form of ticket sales, pay-per-view buys, streaming subscriptions now, or merchandise. And if you're one of the fortunate few who can develop a strong following, or as we call it in our industry, get over, then you can start to refine your work to limit the amount of dangerous bumps and the subsequent damage that it does to your body. So if you take, I'll use Hulk Hogan as an example, and I'll probably use it more than once, but a lot of people think of Hogan, they think of this pop culture icon who, you know, would burst into an arena full of people and simply by cupping a hand to an ear, you know, elicit, you know, huge responses from tens of thousands of people all over the world. But he didn't start that way. He started on the, the territories and he worked a much more physical, rugged style, especially when he wrestled in Japan. Um, so. But over time, he had developed a relationship with the audience. He had paid his dues. And through enduring the, the, the physical pain and discomfort of, of life as a wrestler without fame, uh, he had over time learned how to refine his style. And by developing that relationship with the audience, he had earned the ability to get to a point where all he had to do was give a look or say a catchphrase or pose or cup a hand to an ear to achieve the same result as as much something with much more physicality so therefore you could theorize that he has grown as a performer from the pain <clears throat> a lot of the techniques of pro wrestling can really only be learned through repetition because they are completely counterintuitive uh, many of you will likely be familiar with Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle, who was uh, who won the gold medal in the 1996 Olympic Games for heavyweight freestyle wrestling, amateur wrestling, real wrestling. <clears throat> um, but Kurt's also become one of, if not the best, physical performers of all time in pro wrestling, and is known within the industry for mastering pro wrestling at an alarmingly fast pace probably faster than anyone in history. Uh, and I'm 
I'm proud to call Kurt a friend and I've had the privilege of wrestling Kurt uh, and he is an anomaly um, because often amateur wrestlers struggle to grasp pro wrestling because of their instincts from years of wrestling for real. Uh, I remember being tasked with trying to help train the British amateur champion to try to try his hand at pro wrestling many years ago. And he struggled with taking bumps or um, going up for moves and, and you know working working with your opponent, which you have to do in our industry. And because as he put it, it's just too weird letting you do this to me, letting you take me down. He didn't get it. He didn't make it because he could not go against his instincts. <clears throat> when you first go to wrestling school, the chances are one of the first things that you'll learn is flat back bumps, break falls, as if you're in, if you're familiar with martial arts, they often call it break falls. Uh, you'll might you'll learn rolls and you'll learn running the ropes. Now, when you watch wrestling on TV, you'll see the guys running full speed and bouncing off the ropes like it's the easiest thing in the world. However, when you first train to be a wrestler, running the ropes is one of the most painful parts of basic training. I remember being bruised from the top of my lap under my armpit all the way down to my rib cage on one side of my body, on my right hand side, um, for, for a time. And it was excruciating, especially knowing that I had to do it all again tomorrow. And this is, I'm talking about when I was at Pro Wrestling Camp. Um, and then it's, then the thought starts creeping in, oh, this is going to be even worse tomorrow because I've, now I've got a huge bruise on me and it's going to be really tender. I remember thinking, how am I going to be able to do this if this is what just running the ropes does to me? I can't look the part with a big purple bruise all down my side. How, how come the pros aren't covered in bruises from the ropes? Well, the answer is over time you develop a callousness and most likely scar tissue. In other words, your body becomes conditioned to the pain and the impact. This principle also applies to taking bumps, which is without question uh, the most fundamental skill required to be a wrestler is falling flat on your back over and over again. People often assume that the area that would hurt the most from taking bumps would be your back, and that's certainly true. But for me, I will never forget the awful headaches that I suffered after long days of wrestling at wrestling camp your head gets rattled around uh, when your technique isn't right and certainly if you're in my case if you were naturally skinny and you didn't have as much muscle and padding to kind of keep everything in place uh, it was you know it was exacerbated <clears throat> uh, and over time you will learn quickly how to figure it out or you will likely quit as many did and not to mention the fact that if anyone at this point in time, I wouldn't suggest you do it on a hard floor because it's that would be that would be brutal. But a flat back bump is essentially acting as if someone swept a rug out from underneath you and you fall flat on your back. You make your arms into a T and you try to create as much surface area as possible to hit the mat as hard as possible. Attack the mat is the is the technique that you get taught. And the first time you do it, you get winded. I mean, it knocks the wind out of you. There's no way around it. <clears throat> and I remember having that same thought creeping in again. How am I going to be able to do this if I, it, it, I'm, this is, this is brutal, you know, but over time, the same thing happens. Your body conditions itself to cope with the impact. And while the bumps still hurt, they don't incapacitate you to that level it becomes second nature. <clears throat> now, there's no shortcut to developing this conditioning. There is only one way. You must endure the pain and you must keep hitting those ropes and taking those bumps on a regular basis. So in our industry, from the very beginning, you realize that you must pay for your advancement to the next stage with pain. So that's in a very basic sense covering uh, the physical pain associated with 
with the career choice of pro wrestling. But what about emotional pain? Uh, I'll, I'll give a brief history lesson to create some context for what I'm about to say. For decades, the inner workings of the wrestling business were protected to preserve the mystique and the illusion of what we do. Even if there were doubts in many people's minds about the 100% authenticity of the outcomes and certain moves and sequences, there was no confirmation. So in the, if any of you have ever seen the ESPN 30 for 30 film Nature Boy covering the life of, of Ric Flair, which was uh, actually made by a friend of mine, Rory Karp, uh, Baby Doll, who was a, a popular female manager in the 1980s in the NWA, summed it up very succinctly. She said, back then, people kind of knew, but they didn't know. In other words, without confirmation, one could still suspend their disbelief. I'm telling you this so that you can understand the common practices used by the industry pros of those eras when handling aspiring wrestlers when they first come through the doors. If the business is predicated on suspension of disbelief, it's very important to only let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, with the necessary people, and even then, only when it's absolutely necessary to do so. In fact, there are many cases of wrestlers back in, in, in previous generations who were only told the outcomes of their match when they actually got in the ring, which I can't imagine how, <laughs> how frightening that must have been. So <clears throat> a common practice with aspiring wannabes was to what we call in the industry, run them off, which basically means to make it so unpleasant for them that they quit. And in the days of protecting the business, protecting the secrets of the business, this often involved physically hurting rookies with legitimate holds. Um, and I'll use Hulk Hogan again as an example. There's a very famous story about when Hulk walked through the doors in Tampa, Florida and said, hey, I want to be a wrestler. They said, OK. And uh, next thing you know, Hiro Matsuda broke his leg. Um, and it was to see if they come back. And obviously we have things have refined a little since then, but the purpose was, hey, uh, we can't have any old person coming through the doors and then going off and telling everyone, oh yeah, this is how they do it, you know, because it would have destroyed the illusion. And obviously things have changed a lot since then, but that was the mentality. On my first day at wrestling camp, I was made to take hundreds of bumps run the ropes hundreds of times, perform hundreds of Hindu squats, run sprints with somebody on my shoulders in the middle, in the midday sun, in the, in the middle of summer. And all the while I'm being yelled at and heckled by the trainers. And of the dozen or so of us that went to that camp, I would say at least four or five people didn't come back the next day. And that's the point. Now, while I'm sure that there are some people who simply did this kind of thing just to be a bully. In most cases, the motivation behind the approach is legitimate. It's to weed out the weak. Now, if that sounds a little harsh, it's because it is. This is a harsh business. And the reason that they would do that is because if a promoter is going to advertise you to appear, they expect you to make your commitment regardless of whether you're hurt, you're sick, you're having personal issues, you know, whatever. Obviously, if you're injured seriously, we're not, we're not, you know, we're not suggesting that people have to wrestle on a broken leg or something, but if you're just banged up, you make your dates, you make your commitments. It's one of the number one rules of our industry. Not only that, but you have to be able to perform with intensity, enthusiasm, you know, charisma, regardless of whether there are 10 people in the building or 10,000. And you have to be in control of the room, regardless of what abuse is being thrown at you by the audience. That is your job. So that is why the, those first days of, of basic training are so, so brutal, because they need to see if you can cope with all those different stimuli. And more importantly, or perhaps most importantly, your opponent in the ring must be able to trust you 100% to be safe with their body. 
even if you're tired or if you're sick or if you're emotionally rattled by someone in the audience. You need a thick skin to survive in this business. And while things have evolved and, and been more refined, I would say that that still applies because now we have the added the added thing of social media and the scrutiny of fans where people can anon anonymously insult you, criticize you, demean you with no repercussion. So that that emotional conditioning still has to exist. And it's interesting to me that some of these training principles and practices uh, that, that work, by the way, have come under fire in recent years from the very same people who feel completely entitled to criticize you and, and belittle you and, and, and humiliate you on social media. But that's another story for another day. The point is, <clears throat> once again, you cannot replicate these experiences needed to develop that, that emotional conditioning, to develop that thick skin. You have to feel helpless. You have to feel exhausted. You, most of all, you have to feel humiliated to be able to develop that mental conditioning necessary to weather any storm. And you need the self-awareness to ask yourself, why did I just stink up the place? Why was that match bad? Why didn't anyone like that? Why was it? Why was there what we call crickets? You know, if you can, if it's so quiet, you can hear crickets. You know, why didn't I connect with the audience? So you can look at yourself and figure out how to remedy it. Uh, any psychology students listening to this will likely know that Freud described the pain of the ego as the worst possible pain. And the ego is perhaps one of the most important tools in a wrestler's toolkit. So now that you've heard me describe some of these somewhat harrowing experiences, some of you might be thinking, is this even worth it? Um, I can only speak for myself and say yes, absolutely. Not just because uh, I've been able to earn a, a nice living, but I've also been able to travel the world, meet some incredible people, including my wife, as Chris alluded to, um, and enjoy a lot of other opportunities that otherwise would never have come my way. Like this, for example, I doubt I'd be speaking to any of you today if I had decided it wasn't worth it uh, back then. I often hear the phrase, it takes its toll. Um, and it's natural to look at pain or other bad experiences or let's say pain, be it physical or emotional, uh, that are associated with this industry as a price to pay, a toll. But over time, what I've tried to do is to look at it more as an investment and live with the faith that the investment pays off in the long run. So to reiterate, I think you can look at pain as a price or as an investment, and I choose the latter. So when we're talking about pain as an investment, there's perhaps no better example for this than weight training. I've lifted weights, like Chris mentioned at the beginning, to enhance my physique since the age of 13. The very basic premise of hypertrophic training, and again, I, there are probably people listening to this who, who are far more educated on the subject than I am um, in terms of theory, but the basic premise is you place sufficient strain on muscle fibers to cause sufficient damage, which the body then repairs. And a repetitive challenge to the body of this nature will lead to adaptation in the form of increased size and strength of those muscle fibers. This, therefore, is perhaps the most literal example of growth coming from pain. What I'm describing is bodybuilding. And I talk about this in, in my book uh, that was published in 2015. If you lift weights or you use resistance training of any sort to improve your body, that's bodybuilding. Uh, people like to use other terms that appear a bit more user friendly and a bit more hipster, but the activity is bodybuilding. Uh, I've never competed in a bodybuilding contest, but I take part in bodybuilding. So if you do any kind of resistance training, so do you. And I just want to make that point so that you understand when I'm referring to bodybuilding, that's what I'm referring to. I'm not talking about putting on some trunks and baby oil and posing on a stage. <clears throat> there are a myriad of different bodybuilding principles and philosophies, and I certainly won't get into all those today. 
But perhaps the best principle to discuss to highlight this particular subject uh, is the high intensity principle. Uh, it was first brought to light by, by a guy called Casey Viedo uh, and the controversial Colorado experiment, if you want to look that up. Uh, and then popularized later by Mike Menser and probably most famously by Dorian Yates, who's six time Mr. Olympia, somebody who uh, I've studied quite a bit. So I'll give you a brief rundown of high intensity. The average bodybuilding workout, resistance training workout, will consist of one or two light sets for a warm up and then three to four what we call work sets, which are the sets that are designed to challenge and stimulate growth. Well, high intensity is different in the sense that it consists of one or two warm up sets, but then just one all out work set using heavy weight and various different techniques to reach absolute muscle failure. So you use forced reps, partial reps, assisted reps, forced negatives. The workouts are short, but the idea is that you achieve the maximum amount of muscle fiber damage possible to stimulate repair and growth and then you give yourself more more time to recover and repair that damage. Uh, the technique works, but it's not for the faint hearted. It requires a huge amount of exertion and focus because when you're under a huge amount of weight and you're pushing yourself past absolute failure, it's it's excruciating. It's painful. It's scary. Uh, and it requires a hell of a lot of focus to be able to commit to it. It also requires a very trustworthy training partner who understands that they must push you past your instincts. Once again, you must learn to be counterintuitive. The chances are if you attempt this technique alone, you won't really achieve the results to your fullest extent because your instincts will kick in and you will stop. Your partner has to be the one to assist you after you've reached the point where you're no longer able to move the weight on your own and force you to keep going with full repetitions until there is absolutely nothing left. So once again, you must embrace the pain and go against your natural instincts to achieve growth. When describing his notorious leg training days, Dorian Yates said, I used to train legs pretty much once a week and for four or five days out of every week I had trouble sitting on the toilet. I had trouble moving around. If I didn't, I wouldn't be happy. I had to feel that effing pain. Pain in the ass, pain in the legs, just to sit down. But it's satisfying because you know you've done some damage if it's like that. And the damage repairs itself to get bigger and stronger. If he didn't feel pain, he wouldn't be happy. So is Dorian a masochist? No, I don't think so. I think he was focused absolutely on a singular goal. And he had developed the understanding that the pain was necessary for him to achieve that goal. So therefore pain was the indicator of progress. And for any of you who are familiar with Tony Robbins, you will know that one of his mantras is progress equals happiness. So the pain was the indicator of progress, therefore the pain made him happy. And in our in my life and, and certainly with a lot of my friends who, who lift seriously, we describe that good soreness. I feel I feel like good pain today because it's that understanding that while it may be on the surface uncomfortable, we know on a deeper level that it's helping us achieve what we want. <clears throat> um, over the years, I've had no end of people in my life ask me to help them train with weights to improve their bodies. And, you know, although, and I, again, something I talk about in my book, there are no hard and fast rules to any of this. Typically, I can say that I can usually tell within one session whether someone's going to stick with it or not. I can read their body language, I can listen to their choice of words, and I can feel their energy and I know whether the difficulty has inspired them or deterred them. 
and if the workout itself didn't do it, then often the soreness they feel the next day will be the thing that gets them. Um, I'll use a loving example of my sister-in-law who over the course of the 10 years that I've known her must have said to me at least 10 times, I rock, all right, that's it. I want you to help me get in better shape. I, I want you to take me to the gym. I said, okay. And every time it's the same. If the workout happens, then the next day she calls me, oh my God, I've, I'm so sore. I can barely move. I can't move my arm. I can't sit down. Okay. And I said, yeah, okay. But that means that's good. That means it's working. You know, it won't, it won't feel that way the next time and it will get better and better and better. And every time it's too much of a deterrent. Those people have yet to embrace the difficult truth <laughs> that your body will only adapt if it needs to. And when we're talking about weight training, for example, the only stimuli that will elicit that kind of positive adaptation is an adequate physical stress, not psychological stress. You know, that's that can be that can have devastating effects on your body. And that's a whole other issue to talk about on another day. But bodybuilding itself is simply an adaptation to physical stress and with the correct nutrition, recovery, and most importantly, with consistency and commitment to the work and the repeated embracing of pain and discomfort, results will come. As the French artist August Renoir once said, the pain passes but the beauty remains. And I thought that was a very apt uh, quote to use when describing bodybuilding. <clears throat> so when we talk about growth coming from pain, I've determined in my life that this is somewhat of a universal rule, not limited to my chosen fields of expertise, or pseudo expertise anyway. In November, I launched Legacy Sports Nutrition, which is something I've wanted to do for a long time. And uh, actually the extended time at home and, and much lighter schedule because of the pandemic finally allowed me to commit to making that happen. So again, taking a, a positive from a negative situation, growing from pain. A supplement business, much like any business, involves all kinds of challenges in the startup phase. You know, manufacturing, distribution, label design, trademarks, sales channels, just to name a few. But after months of figuring out these parts, we soft launched in November with, with a view to ramping up our marketing in the new year. Uh, I had planned to dedicate most of my marketing budget to Facebook ads in the beginning. The, the quality of the targeting and the synergy between the ads widget and Shopify makes it very easy. Here's a problem I didn't anticipate. <clears throat> the incredibly picky and somewhat arbitrary nature of their ads policies <laughs> made it very difficult for me to make any progress there. My ads were constantly being shut down for violating various vague and inconsistent policies that never really give me a straight answer. Uh, and that's again another issue for another day, but it leads me to my point. Uh, I reached out to some different consultants and experts in digital marketing. And of course, most of them, uh, once hearing about who I am and what I'm trying to what I'm trying to accomplish, you know, the first thing they try to do, oh, they try to sell me these manage digital ad management packages, you know, in the in the tens of thousands of dollars and you know obviously just immediately just smell money. Uh, and except for one guy who was an avid weightlifter himself, avid gym guy, uh, and, and was somewhat of a fan. And he very honestly told me, yeah, you could pay my firm thousands of dollars to run your ads, but the truth is, is you need to grasp this stuff yourself because otherwise, you're going to be very vulnerable to whoever's running your digital marketing forever, especially as you grow, because you have to know what's working. You have to know how much you spent on, on it and how to modify it. Otherwise, you'll just keep throwing money at guys like me and we'll keep charging you and we'll be able to charge you whatever we want and you'll have no choice unless you want your sales to tank. That hit hard because it was absolutely true. 
And I thanked him for his candor and uh, set about the arduous task of trying to figure this stuff out myself. And it dawned on me that I was forgetting my own fundamental principle. I was trying to pass all this stuff off to someone else. I was trying to just, it's okay, I'll just pay someone else to do this and everything will just happen. It doesn't work like that. Growth comes from pain. Uh, as President Clinton said in a lecture at Georgetown, there is an inevitable and predictable connection between the effort we exert and the results we achieve. I'm pleased to say that this month sales have increased about 300%. <laughs> uh, still got a long way to go, uh, but but things are things are moving in the right direction. And all of that revenue will be reinvested into the marketing and to continue to try to grow the business. And again, that's something that may sting. That in itself will be somewhat painful. But remember, there's no growth without pain. So in conclusion, the next time you think about any challenge, any challenge at all, be it physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, commercial, educational, even geopolitical, I encourage you to try and remember this principle and see if it can shape your thinking and give you a fresh perspective from which to tackle the challenge. The world needs you and your young minds now more than ever. We're facing a climate crisis that's only getting worse. And the only chance we have to survive it is to make massive changes that will likely be somewhat painful and uncomfortable for a lot of people. You will leave university with a degree, hopefully. Uh, and with the rapid rate of changes that exist in tech and commerce, you may find that you have to experience more pain and discomfort by having to do more training to be able to grow with your field especially in an increasingly competitive marketplace. It's not going to be easy, but extraordinary results seldom are. And if you can look forward to the challenges ahead of you and embrace the pain and discomfort that is the necessary investment in yourself in order to increase your value, then I believe you can achieve extraordinary results and live an extraordinary life. Thank you very much.